Please welcome Jorge Guajardo, former Mexican ambassador to the People's Republic of China, Ramon Martinez de la Guardia, Minister of Commerce and Industry, Republic of Panama, Vanessa Rubio Márquez, former Deputy Finance Minister, Mexico, and Bloomberg's David Papadopoulos. Hello, hello. Welcome to populism. I guess this is, this is why they chose Papadopoulos to do populism, I guess. <laughs> we will, uh, we're going to start with uh, Vanessa, the professor here of the group. She's going to actually, because the term is thrown, out, uh, thrown around a lot, but Vanessa, what is, tell us and tell the room, what is our working definition here of populism? Well, there are several definitions on populism in terms of uh, what the academic literature considers that. It can be an ideology, and it can be a thin or a thick ideology. A thin ideology is one that is more simple, that is basically very binary. It's us against you. It's the people against the elites. A, a thicker ideology will be, would be one that has more much uh, depth uh, into it and considers also a certain uh, series of economic and social policies. Uh, but it can also be just rhetoric and discourse. That's another possibility of defining uh, populism. And one uh, other definition of populism, of course, is the one that is more sociological. So it's basically uh, the, the people uh, having a voice for the first time, the people being represented for the first time uh, in, in terms of, of the general narrative and, and general uh, uh, politics. So basically, that's the way uh, populism it, it's defined. But of course, we can talk about the various right. nuances and the so, trends. So when we think about the populism here in Latin America and potential rise of it again to a certain extent, you, you, you believe that it's incredibly important to understand the broader global context of populism. Tell us a little bit about that. I do. I think that Latin America is immersed in what's happening in the world what's happening in Turkey, what's happening in Russia, what's happening in India, what's happening in, in um, the United States. So one cannot understand the populist wave in, in Latin America without understanding that we are part of this wider context, con, uh, context in which uh, democracy is under debate, in which democracy uh, is being um, contested, in which the liberal state is being contested, in which free trade, uh, liberalism, and globalization is being contested. So yes, um, um, what is happening in, in Latin America has a lot to do with this wider context and with these wider international trends. Very good. Now, Minister, I know Panama um, takes very seriously its efforts to keep populism at bay and to, and to seek an approach that is going to last for years. How does Panama, and how do countries in general, vibrant democracies, avoid the trap of poverty begetting populism, begetting poverty, begetting populism? Well, first of all, thank you, and thank you all for being here. Uh, it's, uh, for us, it's an honor to host this magnificent event. Um, Panama basically, has uh, a steady growth in the past 20 years. We, we are the fastest growing country, but the interesting thing here is that we need to consider that that growth has social impact. And uh, to me, to maintain democracy and not uh, fall into the trap, you need to be very careful in allowing the citizens to participate. Uh, I'll give you an example. Last year, President Cortizo um, created a national pact called the Bicentennial Pact, where he uh, invites citizens to propose ideas on the most difficult and sensitive issues like education, health, infrastructure. And those uh, proposals were then reviewed by a committee, mostly from the private sector. And by doing that, the government committed to implement these actions 
187 of them. Uh, that is a great exercise of democracy. People feel that they are included, that their ideas count, and, they, and that they participate in the growth and development of the country. So is there a risk that something like that could take a populist route? I, I don't think so. If, to me, if you, have, if you give opportunities right. to your citizens, if you give them the capacity to participate in uh, free speech, but also make them believe and, and, and feel that they are heard and that they are actually contributing to the solutions, and it's not only the government, right. that is more sustainable. Because governments come and go, administrations come and go, but if you keep the private sector, the citizens involved, we have a lesser risk of uh, falling into that trap. Now, now Vanessa, I know that uh, growth, economic growth and, and social justice, something that's very important to you. Um, related to this topic, right? I mean, something that you saw in your years, that challenge uh, in Mexico, and how does one achieve those things? Because indeed, we've seen plenty of cases with spectacular growth, and it feels like, you know, the population doesn't feel like they're, they're a part of that. I think one thing that when one understands populism and the way it's evolving, we are trapped in the populist universe. And in the populist universe, there's only binarism, there's only manichaeism, there's only uh, paradoxes. And we need to move away from that. And we need to create a, a, a sort of para-universe or, or, or an alternative universe in which we talk about these things, in which we talk about economic growth being a prerequisite for creating any kind of, of prosperity. There cannot be prosperity without economic growth. Mm. Where we can talk about mm. climate change, when we can talk about the feminist uh, wave in the world, where we can talk about all the different nuances and, and the shades of gray, and, and not to be constrained in that, again, populist universe in which it's only binary, only manichaeism. And, and that's the only way in which we can create a different narrative and, and, and a different consensus around what is needed. And, and another thing is that populists have been a very a, a effective in pointing what uh, needs to be done, in pointing the right. lacks of democracy, the lacks of the liberal state, the lacks of, of globalization, but they haven't delivered. And that will get into a certain point in which people, you know, like the fact that the rhetoric was including them, but then what about me? What about deliveries? What about concrete deliveries? We want change, yes, but we want change for improvement. We want change for the better. So we need to make populists also accountable for delivering, right. which, we, which they haven't. Right, now Jorge, um Change for the better of the region has not seen the last couple of years. Of course, the pandemic hit it very hard, uh, along with uh, many other parts of the world, but Latin America in particular. I know that you see, somewhat rela related to this topic, a storm of sorts brewing. Tell us about it. So le let me just reframe yes. uh, sort of this conversation. Uh, and you started out by saying poverty leads to uh, populism. You can I, get into I, a vicious... I, I don't think yes. that is necessarily the case. Okay. I think fear leads to populism, okay. uh, polarization leads to populism. Uh, I mean, you've seen a populist wave in the United States, which is a wealthy country, and you have not seen a populist wave in the Dominican Republic, which is considerably poor country. So I don't think we should just frame it in terms of poverty, therefore populist, or right. rich, therefore right. although, immune although, to populism. Although you do have a half a century of, of stagnant uh, income in the U.S. So, so right. uh, anyway. I mean, yeah. Populist leaders tend to impoverish their countries. That much is true. So you can assume that populism equates to poverty, but not that poverty leads to populism. So yeah. all this to say what I'm concerned about right now, and, and we had this conversation before, is with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we're already, already witnessing a rise in inflation, uh, food insecurity, and these things usually lead to social unrest, which leads to migration. Not necessarily immediately in Latin America, but you can see waves of migration 
from the Egypt or the Middle East countries, which depend uh, greatly on Ukraine for food staples, into Europe. Now, that's where the fear factor comes in. That's fear of the other. So that leads to waves of populism, which then tend to be contagious to other parts of the world, particularly in Latin America, as happened with the effect, for instance, uh, with the MAGA movement, the Trump movement, which was, right. in essence, a, a populist movement that had contagion effects in Latin America. Very good. So um, one thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is on the, um, on the migration issue is, is one of the other drivers that I think you know, we're seeing to a certain extent, and, and it's also related to the, to the global surge in inflation we're seeing, is you know, in the pandemic, you had a country like the U.S. Um, spent fiscally 26% of GDP, um, the U.K. 19% of GDP, Germany 15%. Uh, Vanessa, your native Mexico spent less than 1% of GDP. 0 0.7. 0 0.7 is the exact number. Is the, if 26 perhaps is too high, maybe it's part of the global inflation we're living, is 0 0.7 the right number? Absolutely. The two outliers in Latin America were Brazil and Mexico. Brazil close to 9% of GDP, Mexico 0.7 of GDP. So by any count, that's way too low. And what does that mean? That meant that we had more death, we have more sick people, and we had more companies and SMEs suffering from, from COVID and from the uh, uh, crisis that resulted. So definitely that's low. But, but at the same time, uh, what, what we need to know is that even prior to that, Mexico was not growing, no? When I stood up in, in, in Mexico and I wanted to be challenged by, by the new government, I said, okay, 2.2% is not the ideal you know, growth of, of, of a country like Mexico. Back then, the 15th largest economy in the world out of 194 countries in the world, now the 16th largest economy in the world. But, but zero is, is much worse. And minus 3%, which is a mathematic average of the last three uh, um, years, is, is, is even worse. So again, I go back to the point, populists have been very effective at, at, at pointing out uh, what, what, what the lacks are and what the uh, shortages were of previous policies, right. but the problem is that they haven't delivered. Right, so Vanessa, so if 0 0.7 was the wrong number, uh, what would have the right number have been? And then if AMLO is a populist, as we as many would understand by your definition, um, isn't, don't you typically associate populism with massive fiscal spending? One thing that I should have said at the beginning when you asked me about defining populism is that there's different ideologies within populism. So you can have right-wing populism, you can have left-wing populism, and a mix of And, and which is AMLO? It's in a mix. It's in a mix because I would say that he's very uh, conservative fiscally, because of what I just uh, uh, mentioned. The fact that Fitch just uh, um, you know, said that our, our, our rating was, was again uh, supported today, it's basically a result of that, because we have been fiscally conservative. But, but at the same time, we haven't been growing. Uh, we have been having more poor uh, in the economy. We have been having less employment. And, and that is not sustainable. The, the fact that we're not growing is not sustainable. So, so yes. We have a mixture of all those uh, ideologies within a very populist government. I have a question for the minister, but Jorge, I saw you nod. Did you, did you have something? You, had, you, you wanted to refute a point here. No, no. <laughs> I, I was listening to Vanessa, and I was agreeing, but I, I would say uh, to Vanessa's point, populism is not an ideology of the right or the left. Populism is a means of governance. It, it, it usually is a way to stay in power or get and stay in power regardless of whether you're from the right or the left. So uh, just, I was nodding to Vanessa's point on that. Very good, excellent, all right. So Minister, I, we're in Panama, I shouldn't put you on the spot, but I will put you on the spot a little bit. So um, if Mexico did 0.7% of GDP during the, during the pandemic, mm -hmm. Panama did a little bit more. Now again, I, I understand, tr doesn't have access to the markets that the US does, but does trade at 200 basis points over treasuries. Um, was 2.5% of GDP the right number, or should Panama, which also was very hard hit by the pandemic, should it have been a little more audacious in confronting the economic collapse? Well, David, 
Um, what do you want me to ask? Of course, we, we believe it's a, it's a right number. We had to go out to the market. Uh, we were very successful in, uh, in bond emissions that uh, issuance that uh, allow us to, to maneuver the COVID pandemic, not only in the, in the health um, infrastructure, but also when we had to lock down um, and close commercial activities, uh, some of these funds were used to make uh, money transfers for the people that were um, suspended in their labor contracts, and that also allowed them to have some sort of a demand. So the economy was working, it, lives were, were being saved, and uh, the result is that last year, 2021, we ended up uh, with a growth of 15.3%. So I'll have to say that, yeah, that was the, the right number. And what are the forecasts for growth for this year and, and next? It's around 6 to 7% growth this year. And next year? Uh, 2022 and, and 2023 is about the same number, about the same number, 6%. Got it. Um, when I um, lived in Venezuela, I had the pleasure of meeting um, and knowing well Teodoro Petkov, who was a very uh, interesting politician and, and economic leader there. And he had a saying, he had a job not dissimilar to yours. He had a saying that he always, it wasn't enough to save off Chavismo, he ran out of time. But he used to love to say that his expression was, tanto mercado como sea posible, tanto estado como sea necesario. As much free market as is possible, as much state presence as is necessary. What is your formula for this minister? And what is Panama's? I, I tend to agree with that, but also, I will add something. Uh, the collaboration between government and private sector has to be there. Uh, we need the private sector uh, to, to grow. We need them to have the ability to create more companies and opportunities and create more jobs. And what I, what I believe the government should do is to facilitate that in, in, the, in the best way possible, but also as an example, last year we created uh, a commission, public and private, and we, um, between the private sector and the public sector, um, issued some 38 actions to reactivate the economy. And it's, it is not that they were making po uh, public policies, but they were helping us to visualize the correct public policies to implement and uh, in order to uh, reactivate the economy. So I agree with that, but also to have that constant communication between the private sector and the government is crucial. Vanessa? Perhaps I would only add that, that I agree with, with what uh, Ramon just said, but I, I would say it's, it's facilitate definitely, it's also regulate effectively, and it's also protect when necessary because in countries like ours, emerging economies, developing economies, it is also very relevant to understand that you have extreme poverty, that you have poverty, that you have people with lack of access to food, education, health, uh, housing, services to housing, and, and you also need to provide for that. So, so as long as the state strikes this very difficult balance between enabling a, a, an environment for the private sector to flourish, also to regulate adequately the different sectors of the economy, but also protect the most vulnerable and especially the poor, I think that's the perfect balance in, in, in a state and in a government. So related to this, Jorge, as I see um, protective barriers going up across the world on trade and other fronts, um, to this point, is this, do I interpret this as some sort of knee-jerk populist erroneous response, or is, is there, does, does some of it make sense? Again, uh, always think of populism as fear of the other. There's always the underlying uh, theme of fear of the other. So uh, you see, for instance, uh, India implementing export controls on wheat, 
Well, that's fear of the outside world coming to take over your food supply. What if India is legitimately running out of wheat? And that could very well be the case. And that's going to start happening. I think we're going to start seeing a trend in many other countries implementing. That, that a, is not a one off isolate. We should not interpret that as a one off event. That is just the beginning of. The thing is, how do you play it politically? Uh, do you play it within populist themes or do you play it as a policy issue? Uh, there may be an argument to be made for food export controls, there's, but there's a temptation of the populist messaging of implementing them precisely to protect the people from the outside, uh, to protect the food going to feed others. So that's how you play it politically, and that's what populists are so good at. And that's what I'm afraid that these times, for these reasons, are just fertile ground for populism. Right, you were saying that food migration, essentially food security is, is a growing driver of migration up, replacing something like security, for, which was in the past, correct? Yes, I mean, we've seen food export controls in the past in other countries, even by populist governments, and I'll use the, the case of uh, Kirchner in Argentina, implementing a, or putting a tax on beef exports. Uh, but it's, even though uh, it's done by a populist leader, it's not necessarily done with a populist messaging. Right now, what you're seeing is populist messaging for these same policies. And again, that's a temptation. It's an easy win for the populist leader, so the ground is fertile to use this type of messaging to uh, get power and stay in power. Got it. Now, Vanessa, so if, if I look across the region, I see, over the last several months, I see Castillo winning in Peru. Boric winning in Chile, Petro potentially winning two weeks from now. Um, and I wonder if this tilt to the left, it's in some ways perhaps a, pop, a tilt to the populist left, is this, are we just seeing the uh, initial innings of, of a sea change coming, in part sparked by the pandemic, or are other dominoes to fall as it were? I don't think it's necessarily a result of the pandemic. I think it was exacerbated by the, by the pandemic, but it was growing even before the pandemic. In, in, in the case of my country, Mexico, the current president campaigned for 18 years, no? So definitely something was brewing there before the pandemic, and, and I would say that that's the case in Chile. That's the case in Chile, that's the case in Ecuador, that's in case in Peru, that's in case in Mexico and in many other countries. And I would add up to what Jorge said, it is fear about the other, and, and, and that happens a lot in developed countries, but in the developing and the emerging world, it is more being against the other, and defining us against the elite, and defining us who have been abusing uh, the system. So, so I also think that there's this, this very, uh, you know, manichaeist way of viewing the present, of viewing uh, uh, the narrative, and of course creating a very appealing rhetoric, no? That, that is uh, very, very paradoxical in, in, in many ways. So I, I, I see this uh, wave as being brewing before uh, the, the pandemic, but being exacerbated by it. And so, also, uh, yeah, go ahead. I, uh, I agree completely. And uh, the other thing that we have to be careful is uh, young people are, are voting more. Mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps it's, it's more difficult for, for them to understand what, what is the change? What, are, what am I changing? It's, it's like I need a change, but that sort of speech is, is, um, is really hurting all the, the countries. And that's why I was telling you, if we can incorporate young people into the decision, into participating, into giving ideas, perhaps it's a, it's, it's a way to also control or, or contain uh, that, that threat. Got it. What I, what I haven't gleaned from you guys is if Petro's winning in two weeks or not, but I guess we'll, we shall see soon enough. Now, I have a great question from the audience, which I appreciate very much because it, it, it brought me to a question I had here and I had forgotten to ask him and ask him. I'm going to put the question to Jorge. Because he's gonna. So the question effectively gets at the role of social media and populism and interplay there. And I, and I do reflect back on a piece. The Atlantic had an outstanding cover story a year or two ago, and it talked about the mob in our hands. 
right? That if Madison, 200 some odd years ago, was always terrified of the mob and how the mob was going to was going to lead us to, to, to horrible policy choices and all that. That didn't really play out then. But now we have these mobs. We live 24-7 with mobs in our hands. We're always worked up and riled up. Yeah. Um, so in that, that being the case, is populism, are, are we just doomed to a populist future, given how we're always constantly riled up and worked up and outraged? Everybody who studies populism says that in order to fix that problem or to address that problem, you have to address social media along the way. So the answer is yes, we are doomed unless you address social media. And by social media, I mean algorithms. It's not just uh, the fact that it helps them suck all the oxygen out of a conversation because a populist always has the biggest megaphone, but because the way the algorithms are set right now, you have cases, as would be the case with Facebook, YouTube, and, and others, it, it's a feeding loop of itself, of the fear or, or whatever it is that they're trying to promote. So that, that again is fertile ground for populists. So yes, in order to address populism, evidently you have to address social media. Vanessa? If I may add, I think uh, social media, if we understand uh, uh, populism, we need to understand social media as a platform that uh, made populism uh, in, in some way possible because it, it gave the possibility of people expressing their frustration, expressing their anger. The fact that social media has been used and abused by populist leaders, by populist leaders uh, uh, affecting uh, democracies and by populist leaders affecting and authoritarians affecting elections, for instance, but also one thing that worries me a lot about social media is uh, the blunt lies and the post-factual uh, society. Everyone is entitled to its own views and its to, to its own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own data, to your own facts, and to your own truth. And that is something that we need to deal with in the context of social media. And are you seeing any signs that governments are effectively starting to deal with it or not? I think there's a trend of how to regulate social media, how to regulate it appropriately, uh, you know, these deplatforming and these uh, new uh, uh, contexts of, of, you know, how do you engage in fiscal policy for social media? How do you make them more accountable? How do you deal with social media in the middle of the elections and violence? and violence against women very specific in, in the context of, of elections. So I think there's, there's a trend of several attempts to regulate and regulate better, but it has to be something that needs to be done between the government, between the private sector, of course the social media uh, owners themselves, and the society, transparency and accountability. Okay, last question before I, I read our, our we wrap up for the day and I read our list of things to do for the rest of the night, is tangentially, rela tangentially related to our topic here, but it came up earlier today where there was talk about the, that we are in the early stages of our next commodity super cycle, which isn't exactly a populist thing, but I know, Jorge, you think that's nonsense. I think that's nonsense. Tell the room why you think that is nonsense. I, I think, uh, so that was a different uh, conversation that Dave and I were having and we're talking about just uh, world issues, and I, I just see a Chinese slowdown for the foreseeable future, and by foreseeable future, I mean 10 to 20 years of China growing uh, to 2 to 3 percent a year at best, and, and just implicitly, since China is the biggest uh, market right. for commodities, that will bring down... Uh, there is no scenario in which a low growth, you can have a low growth China and a super cycle. These things cannot happen simultaneously. My, my thesis is that no, there is no, no super cycle without China as the main market for her. There is nobody to substitute China, China's uh, hunger for her. So basically commodities. everyone should go out and short oil now. Right? <laughs> well, that, that's my thesis anyway. There we go. Short oil. That's what Jorge says. Okay, I believe we are wrapped for that. I, I appreciate, thank you very much to all three of you.